Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 43 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we are going to be talking about some exciting news here from Wolf Precision. So we got some updates on some of the custom rifles. We also are excited to announce our Extraordinary Guide to Accuracy video series is up and running. So if you're new to listening to the podcast here, we build custom rifles for a living. We also own and teach a long range shooting school. And with the shooting school, we've been working on a video series. The video series is based off of a book that I've been working on for about the last two years called The Extraordinary Guide to Accuracy. And so we are incorporating this an entire video series is being posted up on YouTube, a couple videos at a time. So We just posted up our introductory video to the series itself. So if you get a chance, stop over to our YouTube channel. It's Wolf Precision. Check out our introductory video. And don't forget to either like us there, follow us, or don't forget to hit the notification bell if you'd like to see some more videos as we release them. We expect we'll be releasing about one to two videos a week. And we think the entire series is going to run 100 to 200 videos long. So it ought to be a great piece of content when all the work is done this year. So I'm really looking forward to sharing all that with you. So in this episode of the podcast, we are going to be talking about weight. So we're going to talk about the pros and cons of it. And we're going to be weighing in on our decision when it comes to the weight of a rifle. And the positive and negative influences you should take into consideration when building one. So without further ado, here we go. All right, so welcome to episode 43. One of the things I want to talk about in this podcast here that has been on my mind to to bring up in a conversation and to do a, a segment on is the weight of a rifle. And we we deal with this and talk with this on a regular basis when it comes to customers. And you have two ends of the spectrum. You have the really heavy tactical type rifles, which now when you get into the PRS series, you can get into 18 and 21 pound rifles, really unheard of or, or very rare in, in the traditional sniper matches in the sense of the word, you know, back in the, the mid and early 2000s through before PRS really kicked off. You know, uh, a sniper rifle, quote unquote, was just a really accurate field rifle that was designed to shoot from multiple positions well. So you could shoot it standing, kneeling, setting, prone, slung. It was it was a tool. The uh, PRS has added a lot of weight to that because they're now shooting off of a lot of other items. Um, They've got other attachments. And they're really under a clock for really timed precision shooting. So it's it's pushing that that fast follow-up shot higher, which requires them to try to do everything they can do to reduce the recoil to stay on target or to get back on target quicker. And there's two ways to do that. You either add weight to the rifle or you reduce the recoil through caliber selection. And so that's where that dance is coming. And it's not really uncommon now to see, you know, guys talking about 19 and 20 plus pound rifles. Certainly not something I would carry around groundhog gunning anytime soon. But when you get in your traditional type um, either long range rifles, or I even like to go and talk about hunting rifles, for example. The weight becomes an issue where you'll hear guys just like they would brag on the price of a rifle that it's more of, well, well my, my rifle costs this much. Well, the weight becomes an issue because they're using that, like, well, my hunting rifle is five pounds, one ounces. And, and I get it that there are situations where you want to really let, a light rifle because you're going to pack it. You're going to climb up a mountain with it. And there's there's absolutely all the truth in the world in that ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain when it comes to that type of climbing and crawling and, and you've got all this additional weight on your body that has to move it up the hillside. But I do want to throw out there that that absolutely without a doubt comes at a cost and a price. 
And so I want to throw out there some things to think about when you're selecting and building a, a quote unquote hunting rifle. And then when you start getting into that, that, well, I've got to cut weight everywhere that I can, right? I'm going to do a little pro and con here or pros and cons to light rifles, heavy rifles when it comes to hunting rifles. So we have a line of rifles that skirt in the seven pound range, high sevens, low eights, which for a traditional hunting rifle, 18 to 21 inches, carbon fiber barrel, carbon fiber stock, might even be a pound heavier than what they they could be. We could uh, we could reduce the weight by not having an adjustable length of pull and adjustable cheek piece, and we could reduce the weight by shortening the barrel and different contours. So here's some things to think about. We've built a couple really light rifles through the summer and have been testing them back and forth with um, a moderately light rifle. What are some pros and cons to the the weight? So when you look at ultralight, what are the pros and cons to ultralight? Well, the pro, and by the way, the only pro, is it's light. But the list of cons, things that you're sacrificing or degrading, is actually really high. For example, a con to an ultralight rifle would be caliber and caliber selection, Certainly, if you get into heavier recoiling magnums, then you've got you know that much more felt recoil and velocity and energy coming back to the shooter really violently. And so now you've got to compromise maybe caliber selection because of the increased recoil that you're going to feel with an ultralight rifle. So, for example, even a 7-pound, 13-ounce, 6.5 Creedmoor with a moderately heavy scope on it still bounces off target pretty good, right, and, and can still bump the shooter. It's not... It's not recoilless. It still has recoil. So you take that same rifle and shave it down to six pounds, maybe six pounds and change, to get all of this weight out of the rifle that you're going to carry. Well, that comes at a cost. So the first one is recoil. And that goes along with, you know, sometimes limiting your caliber selection because a 300 weather being an ultralight six pound rifle would be like getting punched by Mike Tyson, if you want my honest opinion. Uh, not that it can't be shot, it can. And there are guys that can absolutely handle it. I get that part. But would you would you take a voluntary punch from Mike Tyson outside of the bragging rights that Mike Tyson punched you? But would you want to voluntarily just get hit that hard, you know? And then the train with something that's going to hit you that hard all the time. The, the other con, and there's a list of them here, your follow-up shots. When you pull the trigger, even on a, a moderately light rifle, and depending on caliber, of course, even in the 6.5 Creedmoor, suppressed even, that rifle bounces, comes up off target, and lands sometimes somewhere else other than looking at the target. So now you've got to refine the target to do a really fast follow-up shot. And in a hunting situation, that's not ideal. You know, the animal's moving and your rifle goes in the other way. Now you're, you've got this, this frantic race to try to find the target again. If your optics are dialed or zoomed way in and you've reduced your field of view substantially, that even becomes that much harder. And so you see them, you watch guys shooting and, and hunting, and they're, they're looking all around, you know, pointing their rifle all over the place trying to find the animal. So another con would be the, the follow-up shot, you know, getting back on target. Another con would be the absolute no chance of spotting your own impact, whether hit or miss on the animal. And this is a big one. We talk about this at the shooting school and caliber selection. I have no doubt in my mind that there are ways to get calibers calmed down, you know, with brakes and, and weight and everything else. But when you're on a hunt, I, th I like to think as myself is, or you should think of yourself as the best spotter that money can buy. Because you truly are the only person that can see it from your perspective. And a lot of times the people that are hunting with you, the guides that are guiding you, they might not have spotting scopes with reticles. They not be, not be well versed in what a mill looks like or how to measure it, how to gauge it. You know, they're going to tell you you're a tad left. Well, a tad doesn't mean much when you're looking through a mill reticle. You know, this stuff happens. And so when I built my own personal hunting rifle... 
when I went out um, elk hunting, for example, my, my rifle while kitted out was actually getting close to uh, 12 pounds, and it was an unbraked 264 Win Mag. And the reason it was built that way is, A, I could shoot it all day. It did, the recoil didn't bother me. And B, I could spot my own shots shooting the appropriate loads and bullets. And so I increased the weight of the rifle up so I could shoot it without a muzzle brake. Without a muzzle brake. Um, totally another subject, but I'll just touch on, on this real quick. My hearing is, is about shot from all the years of military and law enforcement cert, uh, matches, uh, aviation, um, you know, you name it. And so I, I asked myself the honest question. If I put a muzzle brake on a gun, especially a hunting rifle, and that animal steps out at 50 yards and I have a choice to shoot the animal or put my ears on, what are you going to do? My answer would be I'd shoot the animal. And so I know myself too well that I make sure that I build a rifle that either is A, suppressed, which I'm very fortunate and grateful that we can shoot with those, but then – or get something that I can shoot unbraked to protect my hearing and those people around me. I want to be able to spot my own shot. That's really, really important. So there's another con for you. Spotting your own shot. Let's just say we we move up to a medium weight. Not considered a lightweight, but maybe a moderate lightweight rifle. And we start getting into the 7 to 7 pounds, 13 ounces range. What are the cons? Well, it's it's a pound heavier. You know, it's a Coke can. Yeah, you know, that's that's really what it what it amounts to. If the weight's in the appropriate area, even even with a heavy scope on the rifle, without a suppressor, you still might be a little limited to spotting your own shots, and you still might get a little bipod hop. You're certainly going to have a lot less recoil. Now we're talking suppressed. If you put a brake on it, that really tames these things down. But as you can tell by the last um, – by what we were just talking about, I'm not really a big fan of brakes on hunting rifles. I would rather you get more skilled with a smaller caliber – then, then get a caliber so big that it requires a break, right? Uh, just for so many reasons. But you get up into that seven pound, seven pound thirteen. You put, you know, a good set of optics on it. You have an adjustable length of pull and cheek piece, which, by the way, adds weight. And then you throw a bipod on it, and you can practice with it all day. Like for example, we had two rifles that were twins, but only about eight ounces apart, nine ounces apart in weight. And that's sort of what got me into this conversation here. But the other shooter's name was Walt. Walt was working with me, and his rifle was a little lighter than, than the one that I had just recently taken out. And we shot these rifles uh, side by side. The felt recoil is definitely there, more substantial. Not not hurting, you know. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about, when I say substantial more, I'm not talking about 300 wind man kicking you. What I'm saying is shooting that rifle compared to my rifle that I took, uh, you could certainly tell that, you're getting more of that recoil and velocity back onto the shooter. And it was just enough recoil suppressed to hop him off target. Now, at the longer stuff, of course, your field of view is bigger. So, you know, three, four, five, six hundred yards, maybe you could spot your own shot a little bit better. But at the close stuff, no way. Um, you could see the steel swing. But, you know, when asking, can you actually see your bullet strike the target? The answer was, Ugh, you know, not not really. Um, it's close. But what were the pros and cons to it? Well, you know, you're taming the rifle down. You're making it more pleasure, pleasurable for the shooter. Um, it, it is an extra, you know, 12, 16 ounces to carry around, you know, in this case. So it, it does add some weight. And we'll talk about ways to deal with that here in just a minute. But what you've done is you've added weight, which is the only negative side. But you've now taken all these other things and you move them up a notch from a scale from one to 10, you know, can I spot a little bit better? Can I self spot? Am I reducing recoil? You know, can, am I more comfortable shooting it? Go one step further, now small, but one step further. So the rifle that I personally shoot is a McMillan A3 and one of my favorite rifles for sh uh, stocks for sure. I, I really do think that it's probably one of the best fieldable quote unquote sniper stocks it just does really well at shooting everything. So you can shoot it prone for sure. I mean, we have competitive shooters for the last five years that have shot them in matches. But you can shoot this stock off your backpack, off your buddy wearing his backpack, 
uh, off of, you know, sticks, unsupported, slung. I mean, it really is one of those just really great all-around rough-and-tumble stocks. It's a little bit longer than your traditional hunting stock and probably, you know, three or four ounces heavier. And the one that I built for myself, we use a special filter. And we talked about this in previous podcasts where we have um, a weather beer or a little bit heavier, denser fill through the action and actually in front of the action and through the recoil lug area to really mitigate any flex or bow and really stiffen that area up because in the end, uh, we're still accuracy driven. And so we don't want to do anything to reduce weight that reduces the overall shootability of the rifle or the accuracy. So we sort of stay with that. To move the story forward, the rifle came in at right around 8 pounds, 3 ounces, 8 pounds, 4 ounces. Maybe a little heavy, you know, for for a hunting class rifle. The difference, longer forearm on it, which put the bipod out in front more, that changes how the rifle hops, recoils, moves, bounces, balances. But... Adding that little extra weight, which now we're talking about probably close to 20 ounces, you know, compared to what would be considered a lightweight hunting rifle. The shootability of that rifle in 6.5 Creedmoor, they were like shooting completely two different rifles. And the only thing we did was change up the stock a little bit. The other one had a, a warden on it, McMillan Warden, which moved the bipod forward and added weight. That combination all of a sudden totally changed everything about that rifle. How it recoiled. Could you spot your own shots? Absolutely. Way less bipod hop, just more of a pulse than, than a true up, you know, hop of your feet coming off the ground. And, and even Walt commented that, you know, you were think we were shooting two different calibers, even though the weight difference was sort of close. And make a short version of a long story, Walt ended up putting back his A3 on his hunting rifle. So when, you, when you're building a hunting rifle and you're getting into to this type of shooting, just be careful because as you swing the pendulum one way too far or the other way too far, there's a lot of negatives like yin and yang that accompany that that swing getting to the extreme outer edge. So for example, if you swing the pendulum to the heavy side of a 21 pound rifle, well, in Idaho, you can't hunt with it. Uh, They have a weight restriction on rifles, but you know, yeah, you can shoot it and you spot it. You know, yeah, you could probably get a way bigger caliber, even unbraked and shoot it, but you pay a really, really, really heavy price with the weight uh, to carry that around in the, in the field. You're going to lose that, that slung type shooting that you're going to do with it in the field or or what I would say like almost like bushcraft shooting because the rifle is just so, so heavy. And so you, you swing the pendulum too far one way and the heavy and you get the same thing. But you have to picture the pendulum going to the light side and when you get to that extreme swing where it's, you, you know, you've got it leaning towards that outer edge of possibilities, then everything else becomes exaggerated as far as their problems that they produce. So try to get that pendulum to swing back a little more, you know, try to come up with more unique ways to carry your rifle in the field. You know, I always carried my rifle in an Eberly stock uh, gunslinger pack. So I could, you know, if I wasn't hunting, if I'm walking in in the morning or, you know, if I'm just like, for example, climbing up a steep rock face and I don't want to be climbing with my rifle on my shoulder, you know, so I'll, I'll slide the, the rifle in my pack it's now being supported by both of my shoulders and my hips because, you know, it can strap around your hip real well. I've got really complete control of the rifle. It's not really that extra pound makes no difference, you know, or two pounds. Carrying it, yeah, I mean, you carry a 12-pound rifle all day. Your arms get a little tired, but uh, that's the price you pay. So just be careful. What I'm saying is don't let the pendulum swing so far that you become, you know, a race to who or bragging rights as who has the lightest rifle and premium ultralight, you know, titanium, everything, you know, there's, there is a price to pay. And when you get to those outer fringes of the pendulum, you lose so many other things as a shooter that you really want to be able to rely on and do. That's also a very important part of the hunt. Follow-up shots are just so important. 
and being able to spot your own shot is just so critical as from the perspective of you, the shooter. So when you crack that round off and it goes flying down range and if you see it impact the animal where you were aiming, your mindset is in a totally different place as you work the bolt and the animal tries to stay with the herd. But if that round goes off, bang, the rifle goes up in the air, comes back down, animals are running everywhere, and the first thing you're going to do, if somebody's with you, is you're going to turn around and ask the guy, hey, did I hit it? And then the next thing you're going to be like is, which one was it? Where's he at? Where did he go? You know, you just, it might have been a great shot. But as soon as that rifle cracks and it jumps off the animal and you have no idea what just happened and animals are running, you are not in the right mindset to do a follow-up shot that's of any quality because you've just really elevated everything from your mental state to your, your blood. I mean, you're, you just boom instantly. You're, you're almost in that panic mode where if you can take, for example, the guy that puts that round, bang, the rifle stays in place, the bullet goes up. Wow, you know, you see a really great shot, you know, just right above the shoulder. You work the bolt and you're staying on the animal. And then the animal gets out there and stops and you put a second round in them. You're in a totally different mindset than the guy that that is in frantic mode trying to find out even if he hit the animal and then trying to figure out which one he is, where is he at, which one is it. You know, you, you can picture they are in totally two different worlds. I like to be the guy that I can spot my own shot. If it's a good shot, I'm working the bullet, staying on the animal, and putting another round in them. If it's a if it's a miss, then I can do a really quick follow up shot, spotting my own impact. And then if I can't see my own impact at that point, I would I would I would have conversation with the guide or who or partner whoever I'm shooting with that that's going to be my backup spotter. But that's the price you pay, and. When I took my my elk gun out, I got a little flack over it because it was it was a two sixty four Win Mag. Uh, it's the biggest caliber that I owned at the time, and and it was one I shot a lot and felt really comfortable with, and it didn't require a muzzle break. And the same thing with like the six five Creedmoors and and six five PRC. They are really taking off in the hunting world because they have those attributes of lowering the recoil, allowing the shooter to to practice and enjoy the rifle more. Still absolutely devastating on animals up to guaranteed up to the size of the elk there's no if ands or buts about it keep your shots within reason of course but there is no doubt in my mind a 6.5 creed mark can kill an elk we have lots of customers that have sent us pictures of of doing just that you know they've they've harvested their animals with 260s and 6.5 creed mores and and a couple of 6.5 prcs but you know i'm a big fan of that caliber i think it's a rough and tumble bullet and it has those other qualities that I'm looking for of lower recoil, better follow-up shots. But then you combine that with a rifle that's not on that edge or fringe of ultra lightweight, and you've sort of enhanced all the good things that you're trying to accomplish with the one thing that sort of stinks, and that's adding a little weight to the rifle. But I, I would rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That's sort of how I look at it. So what are, what are some ways that you can deal with the weight of the rifle? And, and I and mentioned before, my hunting pack is an Everly stock backpack, and it's the Gunslinger 2, I believe. And it's got that scabbard that you can slide the rifle in between your shoulders uh, so you can bear the weight of the rifle on both your shoulders and your hips with the with the uh, waist belt. You could walk around with a, an 8, 12-pound rifle all day long with that on. You wouldn't even know it's there. I You know, most people in their backpack itself wouldn't, wouldn't really notice a pound or two, five to ten pounds. Yeah, you're going to feel that, but a couple extra pounds just just to give yourself that little extra couple benefits of controlling the recoil. I really do think it's worth it. So we get asked all the time, you know, are we going to do an ultralight rifle? And we can get the rifles a little lighter. We can re- we can reduce the weight number one by getting rid of the adjustable length of pull and adjustable cheek piece. So on the Game Warden and the A3, they can be purchased without it. Just have the length of pull set to where you want it to be. And then there's a couple different cheek pieces that you can add. They're almost like not a rubber material, but but like um it's like a a neoprene type material that will stick to the stock to give you that little extra raise in the cheek piece area 
that doesn't permanently damage the stock. You can take it back off later. I think one of them's called Cheekies, and I'd, I'd have to look at the other one that we use pretty common. So if you need to get a rifle in that weight category, we have additional ways that we can reduce the weight on the stocks. We can still do edge fill, which McMillan does, in their really ultra light stocks, which does remove more weight. And then, of course, getting rid of the adjustable length pull, the adjustable cheek piece. And even at that point, start looking at 16 and 18 inch barrels. If you're shooting a rifle that light, more than likely your shots are going to be, you know, two to 400 yards, 500 yards max. And so you don't need that extra barrel length to add weight to the front of the rifle and take away from what you're really trying to accomplish by cutting the weight down on the rest of it. So at that point, go much shorter on the barrel too. And that would sort of double down with the weight reduction. The other thing I think that's pretty important is we are working with Krieger right now to do uh, two more contours. Uh, one is like a, a Magnum hunting rifle profile, which still allows us to, you know, we can cut the weight on the rifle, but we can still thread 5H24. That's common for our suppressors and, and muzzle brakes. And we are doing a couple prototypes that still stay stainless steel, but allow us to thread half 28. And so it'll be in that, that, lighter much lighter category it will keep the price of the rifles down in that 39.95 range without the adjustable length to pull an adjustable cheek piece still have a stainless steel barrel and remove a, a lot of the weight while maintaining that stainless steel protective property of the barrel so it's not going to rust you know we're not a big fan of chrome molly so we're getting the stainless steel as small as we can get it uh, without taking it too small keep in mind krieger won't build stainless steel barrels under a number five contour they, they sort of have this limit that they set on it because in hunting in extreme cold conditions, it can it can cause some issues. So I guess the next time that you're out there at the range and you get a chance to shoot some different rifles, play with the weights of them and see just exactly what we're talking about, how something so simple as just 12 or 16 ounces in the right places. For example, like Walt's rifle at 7 pounds, 13 ounces compared to mine, it was like 8 pounds, 3 or 8 pounds, 4. With the bipod moved out a little bit further because of the A3 stock, just made an absolute world of difference on how the rifle handled, recoiled. Uh, that's why we sort of call the A3 our, our long-range hunting rifle. And then you get into the A10s, which would be, you know, for maybe the more appropriate Magnum types. But I find it amazing, even after shooting all of these years, how just little things can make a difference on how the rifle reacts, how you recover from the recoil uh, quicker, how you can stay on target, how you can do faster follow-up shots. Just really good things to think about. So next time you get out to the range and you get a chance or you have people that are shooting different weight rifles, uh, even in the same caliber, ask them if you can shoot a couple rounds just to really see the difference. And in, in I think sometimes when they're really close in weight, six, seven, eight ounces, you really start to realize how much that really makes a difference, even though you wouldn't think that six ounces on a rifle would mean much of anything but just get that pendulum swung back a little bit and bang there it is and you've got yourself a really good hunting rifle reasonably weight for sure but something that you can actually use to its full abilities and not really give up some of the precious things that are really important to us to shooters such as self-spotting and follow-up shots and and so on and so forth well, I hope you all get a chance to go over and check out our YouTube video. We did release our first uh, video in the video series we're calling The Extraordinary Guide to Accuracy. And we talked just a little bit about what's coming up in the series. We'll have another video being released here in a couple of days. Our goal is about one to two videos a week. It's going to take us a little over a year to film and produce. The Extraordinary Guide to Accuracy, just to uh, give you a story behind it, I was working on a book for the last two years. And... In the process of working on this book, we started this podcast about 18 months ago now. And for me, it just makes sense to – we've we've learned so much doing the podcast and being able to get you know, really good content out to the listeners and just really just trying to help shooters, uh, you know, trying to give out some good advice hopefully and you know, maybe give some pointers to help guys that are struggling at the range with certain issues here and there. And of course, some of it's our opinions and you know, you know how that sort of goes. The – the video work, though, I think is so crucial because it allows us to show what's happening. And so we're going to do a lot of video work, uh, which which would be almost similar to what we do in our classroom. We're covering a lot of the same subjects, but it's going to be accompanied by this, uh, like demonstrations where we can actually show what we're talking about. And I think that's so, so important. 
you know, when we get to the range, we're going to cover a lot of the subjects. We're going to be out doing a lot of shooting this year. And we're going to get to cover a lot of this at the range, you know, in live fire exercises to show you what we work on here at the school and why. Show you the things that we're looking for, even as instructors trying to watch students shoot and pick out the little things that, when added together, create all kinds of trouble for shooters at distance. Um, Enough, in some cases, to drive people just absolutely in the madhouse. One thing's for sure with shooting is some people really get bent when the bullets aren't going where they're supposed to go. So we like to point out these little things that when you start paying attention to them and you start getting them right, then everything else downrange will come into play. So we're excited for the series. Uh, the book was about halfway written, and we decided, you know what? We're going to do it as as a video series. I think it just makes much better sense than trying to, you know, publish a book and then try to put pictures in and point to this and point to that. Let's just do it for real. I think it's going to help people preparing for the shooting school coming in, giving them an idea of what to expect when they get here, things they're going to have to sort of prepare for. So I think in that end, it's a win-win for us that, you know, when they come in, you're really going to be tuned up. And now it's just working on some details and classroom subjects and questions that you're going to ask and all that great stuff. So looking forward to the video series, uh, you're going to see, like I said, probably one to two videos. And as the weather keeps breaking, we'll be doing more and more of it outdoors. But if you get a chance, go over to our YouTube page. It's Wolf Precision. And you can check out our introductory video. It's only about seven minutes long. You can subscribe. You can hit the bell if you want to be notified when the next videos come up. Uh, that part, we super, super appreciate it. So thank you so much for everybody, all of the kind of emails. Thank you so much for, you know, everybody sending in questions and, you know, calling in. We super appreciate it. It keeps me excited to, to stay on the air and keep working on these other projects. If you have any questions or subjects that you would like us to cover here at the podcast, just shoot me an email at contact at wolfprecision.net or reach out to us on Facebook. Uh, we're more than happy to, to either talk to you directly or more than welcome to call the shop or or we can address it uh, here on the podcast. And maybe it's a question that other people are asking as well. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us here at the podcast. My name is Jamie Dotson. I'm your host, and you're listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. Mm-hmm.